598, New Age of Science. Particularly, I want to direct your attention to the bottom left of the page, the scientific method. All right. Essentially, folk, the scientific method consists of that which you can observe and that which is repeatable. Observe, observation, in other words, what here you can observe, and then that what can be repeated. Now, as a for instance, you can heat water and it boils, and your measured temperature is probably 212. Try the same experiment again the next day and get the same results, that's repeatable. That's science. Or, put together another device, like this one, I mean, this may look like a simple device, but actually it's a very high tech, something that didn't even exist 30 years ago. It's remote controlled and blocked or entry to your car, to my car. It involves a lot of high tech. If you put together another one just like it, it will do the same thing this one will. Now in my lifetime, I've seen, well, one big discovery. They discovered planets around some of the stars. They discovered a planet and noticed that some of the stars would wobble and then they wobble again on a very regular basis. Other men observing in different days or different nights, you might say, in other parts of the world observed the same phenomenon. It was predictable. You could tell when the star would wobble to this side, when the star would wobble to this side, and you had to conclude there was a planet going around that star. Then they tried to measure what's the size of the planet based on what they know of Newton's laws of gravity and how far away that planet was from its orbiting star. Again, this is science. It's observable, it's predictable, repeatable, falsifiable, um, but there are certain types of science folk that some people call theoretical science that you cannot really observe. Part of that is a science of how the earth came to be. Number one, nobody was there to observe it. Number two, the processes cannot be repeated, cannot be duplicated. So you call this theoretical science. And because of the nature of the type of science it is, different people have different theories about how the, this kind of science works. The scientific method was used, or tried to be used, to explain the whole universe. And actually, because they believed that science showed the universe to be very, very regular and orderly, they came to believe that you could put the universe together and run it without any kind of creator. That's called secularization. In other words, get religion apart from science and secularize the science, which takes us up to Charles Darwin. All right. Now, I want to tell you up front, I've given this matter a great deal of thought from the time I first taught this course 13 years ago. I've learned a lot in the last 13 I'm teaching it different than what I did then. And if you think I'm a little bit keyed up and nervous because of the topic, you're right, I really am. But I want to let you assure you, you're welcome to dissent, you're welcome to disagree. If you have any comments, pro or con, your comments will be welcome. Just give me a few minutes to present my case, and then I'll be happy to open the floor to anyone who wants to dissent. Now, just about always, when I start to give this lecture, almost everybody in class comes awake. All right, here goes, starting off, Charles Darwin. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote a book. Your authors will only tell you that the title of it was On the Origin of Species. Well, actually, the title was The Origin of Species. That's all they give you. The title, it was The Origin of Species. Sometimes, I'll tell you, the title was On the Origin of Species. But, folk, the actual, real title to the book was on the origin of species by natural selection for the preservation and enhancement all right why are modern authors reluctant to tell you that this was his real title because folk most of Darwin's admirers, in fact, every one of Darwin's admirers do not want you to know that Darwin was a staunch, strong racist. 
enhancement, the favored races. Who were the favored races? All right, I'll tell you. The German was the number one favored race, and the British was number two in Darwin Edmund. I wish I were German. The British, though, he knew, descended from the Germans. So the Germans, number one, the Brits, number two. And who were they? Uh, uh, folk? Let me disclaim this. I do not believe a word of what I'm about to say. I hope you understand that. But in his mind, the disfavored races, the inferior races, were the Jews, the Negroes, the Slavic people, and to a lesser extent, the Oriental peoples, the Chinese, the Japanese. He believed that these were the inferior races. That what he believed then was that the, in, the favored races should be enhanced. But now he stopped short. Now at this point, I had someone in the other class interrupt me and say, oh, it's true that Darwin's ideas were carried out by others and carried farther, but he never called for the elimination of the inferior races. No, but his followers did. Folk, all you have to do is turn over one page, and on page 600 you come across what's called social Darwinism. Charles Darwin's ideas were used by Adolf Hitler to justify the killing of 15 million people, 6 million at least of whom were Jews. The purpose was to eliminate the inferior genes and promote the enhancement of the better races. I had a black man once do a paper favoring Adolf Hitler. I do not know if this black man knew that Adolf Hitler sterilized every black he could get a hold of to make sure that their genes did not pass on to another generation. Should I mention this in a class such as this? Well, I think I should. It is a fact that you can verify by a little bit of research. Um, again, all right, so the man was a racist. Again, as I said, at this point in the other class, I had someone raise their hand and defend the man. If you want to, you can. But he believed, all right, natural selection. I want to comment on that. He believed that the way that, if, all right, he's, well, maybe, maybe I assume you already knew this. He's famous for his theory of evolution. Evolution was that life started out in simpler forms and rose up with humanity being at the top of the order. At the bottom were the one-celled plants and animals. And this is the view that has been expounded by his followers from that day till thence, from that day till this day. All right. He believed that the way that evolution occurred was by natural selection, whereby the weak were eliminated and only the strong were forward, were only the strong reproduced, and then the strong guaranteed that by only the strongest reproducing, the species would get better and better with time. I want to elaborate on that a little bit. I want to pick on a species that reproduces a lot every year, the rabbit. Rabbits have an average of 0.1 chance, or 10% chance of surviving to their first birthday, to live one year, one chance in 10. What about the more fit rabbits? The most fit rabbits, their chances become 0.101, slightly better. The less fit rabbits, their chances become 0.099, slightly worse. What am I getting at? The more fit do not survive much better than the regular unfit. Or the less fit. Now, the un all right, granted, the unfit don't survive. All right, true. But when I say fit, I mean from the 20th percentile and up, the ones below 20th percentile, I mean, have a crippled leg or something or some kind of deformity, they won't survive in a while. All right. Now, I want to remind you, you probably already know about what you see in the way of wild, wild rabbits, wild squirrels, wild mice, wild rats. Folk, to me, they all look alike. Only the ones who are gray on a, on a solid gray with white underneath survive, but you put them in cages so if you can get them to live, and you'll start getting White rabbits, albino rabbits, but I mean, well, of course, albinos are always white, they have pink eyes. But then you'll get white rabbits who are not albinos. You'll get brown rabbits, rabbits who are a mixture of brown and gray. And you all know what I'm talking about. You've seen them. Do these rabbits ever occur in a wild? No. 
When they do, they're eaten. They don't survive. Only the ones who throw, basically the point I'm trying to make by this is natural selection destroys genetic information. It does not enhance genetic information. And it helps to guarantee that the gene pool will become narrower and narrower and narrower. Now, many generations ago, and I'll tell you, a lot of people believe what I'm about to tell you, but the ancient Spartans, the ancient Spartans believed that they should only marry with each other. They believed that they were the best of the Greeks, and they had laws forbidding them to marry outside. So what happened? They all wound up marrying the Spartans. Bad genes came into the gene pool. And after a while, the Spartan people became extinct. Why? They kept in breathing. If I could go back in time and say, hey, you Spartans, you should send your young men over to, send them to Spain to find wives, send them to North Africa, send them to Persia, send them even as far away as China, and send your women out to find husbands from, uh, oh, from maybe Germany or Great Britain, they would have created a more strong group of people than they had. The more diverse your ancestry is, the bigger and stronger and possibly more intelligent you're going to be. That's not natural selection, though. That's not, what's that? That's not evolution, though. It's, it's genetic. Oh, well, actually, evolution, as Darwin taught it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to soon find out what I believe about that. It's, it's well, what do you call it? It's not evolution. What is it? Well, smart is doing that. That's just bigotry. That's not bigotry. Actual, that's okay. not natural evolution. Uh, but it, it, it resulted in their becoming extinct. This is in the records. Because they were, because they were, because they were big. They were, they, they were, they were, they were, uh, they were they also, they were, part, they were inbred. They believed they were the best. That's not, that's not evolution. Okay. Well, we'll soon define what evolution actually is. Anyway, um, I'll be, you know, your, again, your comments are welcome. Um, I want to state about six, seven, eight hundred years ago, the average height of the European male was four foot six. We know this by his armor. Why are European males, or males of European descent, bigger today? It's not because of better diet, folk. It's because we, particularly we Americans, and even European women, tend to marry over the horizon. We marry strangers, persons who none of our kith or kinfolk ever knew or ever met persons with whom we are not genetically related. Six, seven, eight hundred years ago, they married in their community. And after a while, I mean, they didn't marry their sisters, but they were marrying their, on this line, they were first cousins. On this line, they were third cousins. On another line, they were second cousins. They might as well have been marrying their sisters. The result? With that in mind, when, Europe, when Americans went back to fight in Europe during World War I, the American was so much bigger than the European. Again, broader ancestry. And I'm going to, I hope I don't stick my foot in my mouth, I'm going to dare state, I think one reason that so many of your blacks make athletic teams in this country, particularly basketball and football teams, their ancestry is more diverse than that of most white people. Now, hopefully that, is, um, that doesn't sound racist. If anything, it is a compliment. Adolf Hitler had to sit and watch in the stands during the 1936 Olympics while a black runner from the United States outran all the white runners. Did anybody know his name? Jesse Owen. He also had to watch while a black boxer outboxed his German champion. The black boxer's name was Joe Lewis. The German champion was Max Schmeling. Again, you can look it up. All right. Now, now evolution. What is it? Okay. Before I proceed, though, any farther on that topic, there is something I want to state. Um, if I can get that to play. All right, I was talking to a black teacher not too long ago from this school when he reminded me of something that he said, oops, oops. 
There is only, folk, one race. That race is a human race. Now, this is from the National Geographic, and folk, these people are as pro-evolution as they come. In no way is this creationist literature or any kind of religion. They are they're as pro-evolution as they come. But what were they saying? Now, some years ago, I sent them some money to have my DNA tested, and I learned that I'm a gene genotype R1B, which is basically European. The Cro-Magnon man and I share this R1B genotype. But anyway, leaving that, they, in 1987, geneticists made a very super interesting discovery. They discovered that all human females are descended from one woman. All alive today, that is. All humans alive today are descended from one woman, all human females. How do they know this? Because every human female carries mitochondrial DNA, but actually the men do too, but mitochondrial DNA, which is passed only from the mother, it's not passed from the father, so that means it's passed down the generation from mother to daughter, mother to daughter. The men get it, but they don't pass it on. Mitochondrial DNA. Then they discovered, shortly after, that all human males are descended from one man. Because of the Y chromosome, and men, men have a Y chromosome, which women do not have, and this Y chromosome is passed from, of course, from father to son. If a man has a daughter, she doesn't get the Y chromosome, of course, so it's passed from father to son. And they came to the conclusion that all human males are descended from one man. Does anyone have any idea? I mean, first of all, has any, have any of you heard this before? I mean, I know you've heard it. Any of the rest of you heard this? Okay, unfortunately, here for the first time. My mother class, two or three students had. I know that none of you will venture a guess as to what they call the woman. It's not Lucy. The woman from which all women are descended, folk, is a name that comes from a book I'm going to refer to as a forbidden book because this book is not allowed in our public schools that are so. Oh wide open for discussion and politically correct. Does anyone know what they call the woman that all women are descended from? Eve. Eve. Does anyone then know what they call the man that all men are descended from? Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. If your eyes are good at all, you can see it. Uh, if you can't see it, you might want to have your eyes checked. Uh, I mean, uh, when I was in elementary school, I'd tell students they need their eyes checked and some of them got insulted and got their parents on me and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, hey, if you, anyway, yeah. Now, they're saying that Adam and Eve lived in Africa. I'm not going to argue the point right now. What I want you to see, though, folk, is that right up here near the top, all the, the, the female is the orange, which you're going to have a difficult time seeing, but the, this, this is the orange, the, the mitochondrial DNA. The blue is the male. The orange will converge right here near the region, this region right here, maybe you can see it, and then scatter all over the globe. Does anyone know a story about anything that happened in that region of the world? It's near Mount Ararat. Does that ring a bell? Or anyone? Supposing Noah's Park landed on Mount Ararat. All right. If that isn't enough, you might think that I'm saying that Adam and Eve lived at the same time. No. Adam came much later than Eve. Well, how's that? Because of a big catastrophe that destroyed almost every human on the face of the earth except for one man, and that one man's sons, and the wives of his sons and his own wife. Have any of you ever heard a story to that effect? You have, I'm sure, everybody, certainly all humans alive have heard this story. It's called the flood story. The flood story is not only written by every race of people who ever lived. It's been, you find it in China, among the Australian Aborigines, among the American Indians. The flood story, folk, is actually written in our DNA. that shows that there were some disasters that occurred that almost wiped out all of humanity. The most recent one probably being the flood. All right, with that in mind, 
Also, it shows that the human males, some of them you know, branched off here, but a bunch of them branched off in the Middle East and scattered all over the earth. Again, what we might expect to find if some of the ancient stories that we've been told are true. All right, leaving that for the moment. And again, I do want your comments, but please try to hold them for a few minutes. Uh, there is something I want to demonstrate. All right, evolution. Right here. Now this is common genetics that I think you're taught in your biology class. And I'm using peas because this is what Gregor Mendel used. Have any of you heard of Gregor Mendel and genetics? Uh, okay, DNA, uh, by the way, scratched. Gregor Mendel knew nothing of DNA. Gregor Mendel published his work at the same time Darwin published his. It appeared that Gregor Mendel's work contradicted Darwin's. For 40 years, Gregor Mendel's work languished, forgotten about. Finally, it was dug up and found. Hey, this genetic science is useful. Anyway, peas can be tall and short, green and yellow, green and smooth or wrinkled. It's called variety. But, folk, and here's the key to genetics. What I have here is a deck of ordinary bridge cards. I don't know what I'm drawing, but I'll draw one. This, all right, this is a five of spades. Now, some of you might know how to play the game. For those of you who don't, I was able to draw that card out of the deck because the card was in the deck. Okay, that sounds elementary, very elementary. I drew it out. Now, this card not only has, I mean, it has a value and it has rules by which it can be played. This card is seldom going to be the most important card in your deck. Persons who draw it, well, one of the worst cards you can get. But nevertheless, it's in the deck. Now, what if I were to somehow pull out a 1954 Mickey Mantle baseball card? If I would, folk, since I didn't put such a card in the deck, then guess what? Evolution would never occur. What am I getting at? All right, you, I see you don't agree. That's fine. All the genetic information that we observe, folk, is simply recombining genes from the same deck. Each of you individually are part of the human gene pool, but each of us drew almost all the same genes. Human beings are more alike than any other species that overspreads the globe. But there are differences. Again, these, these cards like represent the differences. Um, you cannot draw genes that are not part of the gene pool out of the deck. 